heavy, heavy board. this on December 16th, 2023. Ada Limon is an American poet who first appealed to me when I was discovering contemporary poetry for the very first time. Her collections, especially This Big Fake World, were inspirations to me and my work. The plain spokenness of the style, the narrative element playful, full of life. There was a vigor to a lot of Lamone's work. Lamone had a quirky sensibility to her poetry and an ability to tackle difficult issues of love, obsession, all with style. It may be needless to say, listeners, but I've read every single one of her books. I own all of them. They're sitting on my shelf as we speak. That being said, the hurting kind... Lamone's most recent collection of poems from 2022 is a disappointment, listeners. Something I've sadly grown used to after her latest two attempts at poetry collections, Bright Dead Things and The Carrying, both mediocre books of poetry in my estimation, though, of course, they have been overpraised by award committees because poetry is simply to my own dismay, not an art form that exists any longer, at least culturally. And Lamone's latest collection, The Hurting Kind, is an exclamation point on the death of the art form. Or maybe I've just outgrown her influence. I did ask myself this question, listeners. Maybe I needed Lamone's work to get to where I am now. And I have no doubt The answer to that question is yes. I most certainly did. But from what I can see, the tasteless praise, seemingly endless tasteless praise, if you pick up any major magazine or read a review of this collection, it all seems a little forced, a little too thick. I don't believe it. But we will get there, listeners. But let me first describe my initial reaction to the book. It's long, very long. In fact, seeing that the book was almost 100 pages long was my first glimpse of what I was getting myself into. Thinking that this was it. Lamone had reached that point in her career where editing was no longer required or at least forced upon her in that way. This seems to include self-editing. The sheer number of poems, many mediocre if not outright poor, is too much. It could have been halved and had much more impact as a collection, given the collection more focus in a way. Any poetry collection that goes above 65 odd pages or so is usually when I begin to get nervous. But I knew this before even reading the first page. Any poetry book of this length better be a masterpiece or so original and out there that it creates a reason for its own length. The Hurting Kind is not such a book. It seems to have this many poems in its pages because, from what I can only conclude to be, Lamone has reached a point in her writing that has allowed her to no longer be scrutinized by editors, at least in the typical sense. Of course, dear listeners, I am fully aware that it may be because there is no editor working in publishing right now that could even begin to help a poet edit a collection of poems. I am well aware of this fact, sadly. And the book makes that painfully clear. 
Beyond the sheer volume of work in the collection, the line breaks. Lamone has never been one to give much concern to line breaks in her work, and when I was first getting into poetry, into Lamone and her work, I didn't either. But it becomes especially egregious when one holds the title of Poet Laureate of the United States. Not that the title is anything more than symbolic, of course. I blame no one for achieving it or bestowing upon it more significance than it deserves. But it does deserve respect, listeners. Our culture is too dismissive of symbolic honors like the title of Poet Laureate. I believe it to be an important role, one that can be used to create even more reverence and respect for the art and craft of poetry. And I'm in no way saying Lamone hasn't upheld those responsibilities. I have no doubt she treats the title with the respect it deserves. But honestly, I've heard it described as a burden more than anything else by almost all the former occupiers of the title. And it just rubs me the wrong way every time I hear it. So I plant an arbitrary and, yes, relatively easy flag. But all of this is to say merely that to hold the highest title, however symbolic in nature American poetry can bestow, the books better be worthy of it. And if they aren't, expect criticism. Give me this. The first poem in the collection has a such awful lineation, I couldn't believe I was reading a seasoned professional's work. As I said, listeners, I think I've grown away from this style of poetry writing. It's too messy to me when I read it. Really a chore to read, with the poems already chopping themselves to bits by artistic choice. Beyond that, the poem itself is random and sporadic. It seems the things I used to find pleasantly quirky about Lamone's work have bloomed into a bland mess of random associations in her later years. I fear the worst. The infiltration of Instagram poetry. She's hardly the first to have the now dominant form of poetry, elevated by places like the Poetry Foundation itself, mind you, influence her more recent work. But I can't tell what the poem is about apart from a vague sense of yearning. What the poem is yearning for, mm, I have no idea. It cuts off its own feet before it gets to the finish line. And this will be a theme as I go through this book, listeners. What I found to be rather minor observations about various backyard strolls. It's a sort of portrait of the domesticated poet. A poet who used to do things, experience things, write about them, is now writing about taking walks, about animals spotted outside the window, the writing desk is no doubt facing. Almost every reference to doing something in this book is a memory of the speaker or the poet herself. This continues with the next two poems, Drowning Creek and Swear on It. Both rather elementary poems, all the line breaks looking as if they were not even a consideration when composing and editing these. In fact, the carelessness sometimes seems to take the place of style. Like in Mary Oliver's collection, The House of Light, which I reviewed on this podcast, listeners, Lamone's latest attempt at making poetry strikes me more as inspirational walks in the garden, or backyard, or horse stables, or maybe even a public park trail, and little else. Trying to force some kind of vague meaning onto these very mild observations. And I want to emphasize that, listeners. Very mild observations. What I mean by this, and why I find most nature poems boring in general, notice I said most, not all, listeners, is that an artist, in this case a poet, will always fall victim to their own success in a way. It's unavoidable to some degree, but with nature poems especially, it has been done before. Now, that doesn't mean you can't write a good nature poem, but it does mean 
that it has to be taken into consideration that to write about trees, giving them meaning or personifying them, must contend with all the thousands of years of glory that nature has been written about ad nauseum. And this is a task, listeners. It's very, very hard. I would never pretend I could do this. I rarely even attempt to do this. I'm just saying, if you want to write about nature, you better be doing something with it. In Lamone's case, the mere observations of her own backyard, an occasion for a poem, is not cutting it. But more than anything, Lamone shows a lack of growth as a writer. Her last three books could have all been the same book. In fact, you could interchange the titles and almost nothing would change. In fact, I'd make an argument that they are the same books. The same book being written and rewritten over and over again. Which, fine, go ahead and do that. Readers seem to like it, or at least pretend to like it. But for someone like Lamone, who could do and write and publish whatever she wanted. I find it disappointing that she chooses to do the same thing on repeat for the last few books. It prompted me to start asking questions like, this is the best she can do when given ultimate freedom to create anything she wanted? Literally do anything and have it published, marketed, the whole thing. She's Ada Limone, for crying out loud. She has just chosen to repeat her last three books over again, making the latest collection of poems from the current poet laureate just another collection of poems. That's it. Even the themes are tired and overdone by everyone in the poetry writing game. Again, maybe Poetry Foundation is to thank for this. The word body comes up constantly, desperate to be a theme in the collection. So it can be just like every other highly praised collection over the last decade or so. Bodies. Vague references to bodies. I'm so sick of seeing it. But, and I'll be honest here, I'm mostly sick of seeing it because it comes from social media timelines. It permeates every news story, op-ed, column, literary fiction, marketing copy, everything. It comes from too much scrolling. But of course, that is just my personal issue with the term. The artistic argument against it is that it is so used up by now that it is a cliché. Something read in the pages of every paper, every magazine, every literary journal, every day, for almost the last decade. I'm tired of poetry repeating the social media timeline back to me. Maybe some of you are as well. So much so that I felt the urge to stop reading after the first section. And I know, I know, this has been a personal problem of mine for the last several months now. But even with that in mind, I couldn't help but come to the conclusion that Ada Limone has nothing to say. She has said it all in those first few books and has taken to repeating her previous work over again as she achieves the envious position of total freedom with the backing of the entire literary establishment. I could go on, listeners, but I won't. The poem, It Begins With Trees, was one I singled out for critique. And this was because the line breaks were bad, sure, but again, they are bad in almost every single poem in this collection. From the current poet that sits at the highest perch in the land. But it was more her random associations in these poems than the line breaks for me. The randomness shockingly out of place, hence the word random, in how it is chosen to subvert the themes taking shape in the poem. And it appeared to be an attempt at creating a sort of turning in several of the poems themselves. 
I was shocked reading it, several of which I had to go back and reread to make sure I wasn't making it up, seeing things. Of course, I'll go into these in more detail as we get further into the episode, dear listeners, but for now, I just have to say, I think the associative leaps in contemporary poetry have gone out of control. There is no order to them. There is no clear directive that helps spark something to move from one image to the other. It is only there to move the poem along, lazily, I might add. It has to be earned. But my bigger problem with the seemingly random associations the poems take in this collection is that it is raw subconscious, which is the bare minimum of creativity, the bedrock. Everyone has it. We all free associate all the time in conversation, thoughts, smells, etc. So when an artist uses unrefined free associations, these become insertions that are used more as a crutch to aim for something higher, more meaningful than what's on the page, while always falling short because it is too raw to fulfill its aim. These types of insertions can only come off as desperate. A bad attempt to put a bow on the end of some poems, trying to give it the meaning and resonance it is crying out for, but failing. And it fails because of this poor technique more than anything else. Sure, I've ranted about this before when asked about, say, David Lynch and other artists that are overpraised for pretending that adhering to one's random, raw subconscious as it surfaces is some form of the ultimate truth, high art. But it's not art creation, listeners. It's amateurism. It is half the work, the raw part left on the page as a crutch to move the entire thing along, even if it isn't working. This quickly becomes a bad habit when praised for the reckless use of raw subconscious, its unrefined nature being praised as the ultimate form of purity in art making. But of course, it fails to account for the fact that raw subconscious is just being alive, being human. Art making is when one takes that raw subconscious and shapes it into something. This is what art making is, not just any random association or thought that occurs. That's called thinking. And sure, try it out. It's always worth trying every idea. But judgment, refining that raw idea, that raw subconscious into something, that's art making, listeners. Many are confused by this, and it is often used by artists to grift, but that's what I'm here for, listeners, to ensure that you know the difference and can spot it. The poem Open Water is one I singled out because I thought it gave the best example of what I'm talking about. There is a restrictiveness in these poems that oozes between the lines. These poems desire to be confessional, but don't actually confess much of anything beyond small talk or worse, Instagram-level observations about vacation trips or sitting in a waiting room even, or backyard antics. What I'm trying to say is these poems are honest, yes, but reserved in a way, and not in a good way. Lamone is not giving the reader enough in these poems to feel the vulnerability that is required when composing confessional poetry. Sure, there are a few good parts to many of these poems, some good descriptions and images. I'd never say otherwise, but they are the bare minimum in terms of confessional. Now, I'm not arguing for names and dates, listeners, but confessional poetry only works when it's honest, true, even daring to go places others won't. Lamone gives the reader a little bit of information in terms of confessing something. 
And sure, confessional is a very raw and powerful way to compose poetry, I might add. I have nothing against confessional works, apart from I find the technique overused at this point in the literary history. But Lamont also just withholds a little too much information, a little too much soul. Now, that is to be expected. Poetry, especially confessional poetry, does not have to be this bleeding-on-the-page raw material. I'd never say it had to be. But in this case, in Lamone's collection of poems, it is clear the actual confession is being withheld. Or, perhaps, Lamone doesn't have all that much to confess beyond being a normal teen growing up in America and then a very normal adult in America. The family history is minor when compared to the confessional greats, and there's very little detail when referencing terrible emotional deaths, unknown to the reader, etc. Listeners are well aware of my feelings on this, that if your work requires readers to read a biography before they are able to get any meaning out of your work, then the poems are weak, the stuff left on the page secondary to the events of the poet's life. This is what Lamone falls victim to here, another secondary effect of social media and its ubiquity, in my estimation. Everyone who buys this type of book also follows the writer online in some way, already knowing whatever detail that isn't in the pages. The death of the author is in need of a comeback, listeners. The confessional aspect to the poems gets lost, yes, because of the reservations under the surface. Lamone doesn't appear to want to give us much personal details about her own suffering and family history, which I don't blame her for. It's a tough thing to do, let alone pull off artistically. But I get the feeling these poems are writing to something rather than writing about something. Many strike me as personal little healing diary poems and not something to be published in a 95-page collection from the biggest, most celebrated American poet alive right now. But because the confessional aspect is so buried, the book falls apart. The thing it's relying on for any meaning is distant. Apart from a few declarative sentences, it isn't raw and revealing. Instead, it reads as an Instagram story's highlights reel, this holding back, just the Cliff Notes version, that weaves its way into the works. It strikes me as, yes, I'll say it, afraid. Afraid to be vulnerable and actually confess something. Instead, it feels skittish, eager to stay in bounds in the acceptable field of play. The poems are too afraid to reveal something deeper, something beyond surface-level living rooms and holiday get-togethers. It strikes me as almost childish. Afraid. Hardly the work of a poet at the top of her game. Finally, the sections. Oh, the sections. There are four in this book, listeners, all of them representing a season of the year fall, winter, summer, spring. Well, I'm sure many listeners won't be surprised when I say that they are nothing more than decorations on the page. They don't separate anything and are, again, a desperate attempt to give some form and focus to this collection that is crying out for it. Something real. Something dark and angry, even. These poems seem to be screaming for it. Something to resonate beyond a memory of a conversation at a kitchen table. Instead, we get the seasons. The natural order of the seasons is used to try to stabilize this collection. But of course, this is repeating not just Lamone's older works, but thousands of other poets' work as well. We've already done The seasons are changing poems. The seasons are changing sections. We've done them to death. It is the lowest hanging fruit on the tree. Many of you listening along with me are interested in climbing the ladder a little higher, reaching for that rarer fruit, stepping off the ladder even, 
onto some maybe even unstable branches. Lamone is gathering the fallen, overripe ones off the ground. Heavy. Bored. <clears throat> that was a long monologue. I didn't realize how long it was when I was writing it. But you know, whatever. Whew. All right, let me, get a, let me get a toot. All right, this is Andrew Wittstadt, and welcome to another episode of Heavy Bored, uh, where today we are going over Ada Limon's uh, The Hurting Kind, her latest collection from 2022, published by Milkweed Editions uh, in 2022. And for those that don't know, Limon is currently the 24th U.S. Poet Laureate of the United States. Uh, very, very uh, prestigious, the most prestigious thing you can get. Now, I don't think you get any money or anything for being Poet Laureate. It's just a, it's, it's a recognition. And I touched on this a little bit in the monologue, and I know maybe I'll get into it more if you guys have questions about this or you want me to go into more of it than I am here. You know, send it in, heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. But I think there is this kind of dismissiveness about hmm, even symbolic titles in our culture right now. So something like Poet Laureate, you know, you don't get that forever. It's a temporary position and there's a lot of responsibilities. And I've heard people complain about, you know, th th what you have to do. You know, you have to put together this little kind of, you know, reach out to poor black kids or something in the city kind of poetry movement. You have to pick like kind of almost do this fake kind of NGO foundation, um, nonprofit, you know, oh, let's make poetry cool, guys, you know. And I get that can be a burden. I get that's annoying, especially for people that just want to be writers. You know, like Lamone is in a unique position where she doesn't teach anywhere. Like she doesn't work as a, as a teacher. Uh, so that means, you know, she basically just is a poet and gets lives off of grants and things like that. And I guess her husband or... or significant other i don't know too much about her personal life uh, i've never met her i know a few, a few friends that have met her parents she's an incredibly nice woman uh just you know delightful to to be around i hear uh and i have no doubt i mean she's beautiful she's 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 you know the the kind of literary it girl right now and, and it's it, you know whatever embrace it embrace it I said I have nothing against that. I have nothing against people do. I just think I just wish it would be like treated with a little bit more respect. And, and and I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking of it the wrong way. But you guys, let me know. Send it in. Send it in. Heavyboardpodcast at gmail dot com. Ooh, actually, this would be a good time before I get going to uh, let's do some housekeeping. Many of you listening will know this is a podcast. You can support it. We have a subscription plan, patreon.com slash heavyboard, where you will receive full uncensored episodes of complete access to this podcast for just $5 a month. Uh, if you don't want to do that, can't afford it, there are other ways to support us. You can follow, subscribe, like our YouTube channels at heavyboard on YouTube and at heavyboard clips, our clips channel. Like, subscribe, share, that helps us out, free way to support us. You can also leave us a five star review on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Just give us a little click, give us a little five star rating. It helps us out, helps us grow. It is a free way to support this podcast. We really appreciate it. Uh, what am I missing? Oh, yes. And if you have stories, workshop stories, you want to reach out, you just want to talk, you have questions, anything like that, reach out to me, heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. I will usually get back to you relatively quickly. And uh, I will often even bring on these emails, you know, anonymously. I'll either do that in the jerk shop episodes or I'll do that on one of the solo bonus episodes where I kind of address emails that people are sending me, things, things that people that are curious or thinking, things they want me to address, things that they're disagreeing with me on, you know, I'm very open to that. Please send it in, heavyboardpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, and that'll be a lot of fun. So I think that's it. Yeah. And of course, everything's linked in the description. We do all that. Our YouTube channels, everything's linked down there. I think I even link the Apple rate and review us <laughs> thing down there. So go click it, give us a five star. Uh, it's it is funny that like the the reviews that people leave on podcasts is uh, are quite quite funny. Um, uh, it's always interesting who gets panned and who you know who gets panned and who doesn't. Uh, yeah, but yeah, because we you know we have a mix. Like I think we have you know a couple five star reviews and I, nobody's given us a one star review, which is funny. But they've given us two stars. I guess they're like, oh, I'll give them two stars. <laughs> But, uh, all right, you know, whatever. That's just what it is. 
But here we're, we're, we're talking today about the hurting kind. Ada Limon's latest kind of foray into the poetry world. Um, whew, I don't know what to say. I mean, you guys heard the monologue. You heard my initial thoughts on this. I Maybe I should say about Limon. I think, give just a little, before I start going into this book, give you a little bit about my feelings on it and my journey to where I got to where I'm not a big a fan of, of not as big a fan of Lamone as I used to be, or at least when I was, you know, when I was getting into MFA and, and trying to become somebody who contributes to contemporary literature. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board to get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast. Become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored full length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. So my first encounter with Lamone was um, her first few books, Sharks in the Water, uh, This Big Fake World. You know, these books were incredibly important to me. I thought they were, especially This Big Fake World, I think she was... She doesn't get enough credit for what she was trying to do in that book. And of course, you know, it won some obscure prize, you know, minor prize, as they all do, right? Like these kinds of... I, I mean, and then I just, you know, was obsessed with that, obsessed with that. But I think I have outgrown her work. I think I've outgrown what she's doing on the page. I think what she's doing on the page now is relatively simplistic. I think it's relatively easy compared to what uh, other poets have done in the past. And I think, you know, I said this in the monologue, but I think it's also just a matter of ambition. Her ambition seems to be nothing. Like, it seems to be so mild that I just, it, I don't understand where she's trying to go with this. Like, you can see poets do this, right? Like, there are poets that once they get this kind of acclaim, and this is what I meant in the monologue, right? I, you know, I don't begrudge anybody for getting success off of this. Good for them. But it is, you know, once you get that success, there are some things that are that are negative that come with that. And part of that is, you know, people are blowing smoke up your ass, right? Like friends, family, you know, editors, agents. Oh, well, you're a genius. You know, like, and it's... That feels good to hear, right, when you're the creator and people are saying that to you. But I think, you know, there needs to be a, an even bigger, an even greater focus on the work. And I think, you know, and this is a bad example that people probably won't like, but I, I always bring up Stephen King in this regard. because Why? Well, because I just think he's a good example, one, that everybody knows, and two, because he's so successful, and three, because... You know, he talks about this very openly in interviews and great, you know, he's not a literary guy. I'd never argue that he's some great, you know, voice of a generation. I'm just arguing whenever I praise Stephen King, guys, I'm just arguing that like he's an important figure in the literary history. Um, now, is he as important as James Joyce? Of course not. OK, but I think people do give him the short end of the stick because he writes pop novels and not more literary kind of ambitious novels. But I think people pretend that those pop novels have less influence and stuff on and even the literary side of things than they do. And I think that's kind of a, a defense mechanism, a reaction. I, I just, I just, you know, that's the reason I bring him up. But, you know, he says this where he said, you know, his first couple books, Carrie was not a financial success until the movie came out. Right. People forget that. But his first book was kind of a flop until the movie was made. But it was like. He says this, he says, as he got more popular, you know, obviously he sold more books, he made more money, all that, but he just said, you got, you got harsher and harsher criticism, the more popular you got, right? The more popular he said he got, he kept noticing the reviews and, you know, the papers and stuff were just being harsh as shit on him. And he said, okay, you know, why is that? He's okay. Well, one, I have something, you know, success. They like that. They want that. They want to take me down a notch. He said, but it's also because he said, at least he feels this way about it to not be bitter is like, 
they want to hold me to the highest standard possible because I am the most, you know, the face of, you know, publishing and literature, basically. And people get mad about that. Oh, he's the face. Well, he is. Okay. Like when you say Stephen King, people recognize the name. When you say, you know, Otessa Mash, nobody recognizes it except, you know, freaks like us. Okay. Nobody recognizes that name except for freaks that are really into it. So I just, you know, that's something to consider. And, I, and I'm sympathetic to somebody like Lamone who is, you know, thrusted into this position. You know, she didn't ask to be a poet laureate, um, you know, just got, you know, handed this kind of symbolic thing. And But I do think that in poetry, there is no tendency to go harder on the more famous ones. Like there is just the tendency to endlessly praise them. And that's what I meant about the comment where I feel like, and you know, this is speculating. I'm not saying it's anything more than speculating. I don't know. But I felt that the, the poems felt to me as I was reading them that that she may have reached a point, and again, I'm just speculating, she may have reached that point, and she deserves it, sure. She may have reached that point where even editors at these publishing houses feel that they are that it's not their place to help edit and and, 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 and hone a, a collection of poems. Now, I've heard some stories, maybe some of you have heard some of our episodes. My friend Sam, she talks a little bit about this with editors being more hands-off in just all fields that require editors. Um, and that may be true, but I think it's more so because there is nobody in the publishing industry right now working, doing anything that is even capable, even qualified to help a poet edit and refine a collection of poems. Like They, they, they don't exist maybe what's his face jeff short is that his name again listeners correct me if i'm wrong jeff short at, at gray wolf maybe but i think you know I don't, I don't even know if he's very hands-on with with helping poets craft a good collection of poems and you're seeing this in fiction too there's many people that just can't help writers do this any longer the, the editors are just not doing editing jobs anymore they're just literally being curators which they always were to some extent, but I think there's more so they've, they've you know, um, abstained from the other part of their job, which was helping create the best book possible for this writer, right? You have to help them. At least that's the role, traditionally. And I just think that she's reached a point in her career where she's clearly beyond that. And uh, it's hurting. It's hurting. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say with that. I guess I'm just, it feels like the energy's gone. Like, this is one of the most low-energy collections of poems I've ever read, one of the most unambitious collections of poems I've ever read. You know, funny story here, guys. Um, you know, I was just scrolling Twitter, you know, bored, whatever, one afternoon, and I follow, you know, a bunch of shit, but I... I, <laughs> I don't even follow this guy, right? Like, I don't even follow this, this literary agent who will remain unnamed. I don't follow him, but he works in a big agency. Okay, let's just say that. And he was posting this long thread about this poet that he really liked and how much he went to great lengths to get copies of all the books. And he were posting pictures, you know, in this long thread. And I looked at it and I just thought to myself, my God, this guy is, you know, not the most powerful guy in the industry, but a power player in the industry working at a big agency, you know, he's not a senior agent, but he's up there, you know, he's not a junior agent either, right? He's not a new guy. And uh, I just think, wow, the people who are in charge of plucking talent out of the ether, so the people whose jobs it is, like agents and stuff, to pluck talent out of the ether, they have no idea what talent even looks like in poetry. Like, they have no clue. And I was just thinking to myself, like, oh my God, like, like, People, oh, poetry isn't culturally significant. Yeah, it's not culturally significant. It's not even that, dude. It is non-existent. Like, if I told people, what, here's a good poem, here's a bad poem, like, they would not be able to understand what I'm saying. Do you understand? Like, and these are the people in charge of publishing these collections, which is why they chase TikTok, right? They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're talking about. So they chase whatever's trending on TikTok, Twitter, you know, Facebook, whatever it is. Uh, that's just, you know, my two cents on that, but... All right, let's finally get into the book here, because I know I'm going on and on. It's been like 40 minutes of me recording this already. Like, I haven't done the monologue, and I usually, you know, take a minute, because it's like, all right, depending on how long the monologue is, and now I'm sitting here with y'all being like, fuck, it's like 40 minutes, I haven't even started talking about the poems. But, you know, really, there aren't much poems for me to talk about in this book. I think I liked zero, 
zero poems in this collection. There is not one that I thought stood out to me. There is not one that I thought was, hmm, you know, I can see what she's trying to do with that. No, there were none, none, zero. And I guess maybe I'll say something about how, you know, it is sad when you outgrow your first few influences. You know, I did this with Bukowski. I haven't talked about it much. I want to have somebody on and want to do Bukowski for an episode. Maybe shout out to Matt Wall. Maybe Matt Wall or somebody. I, I know he's a huge Bukowski guy. Um, anybody else who's a big Bukowski guy, please uh, reach out to me. I'd love to have a good discussion about this. Because Bukowski is one that I was enamored with when I was first getting into poetry. But then as I matured, as I learned more, as I, and I started to become more ambitious in my own writing, I started to notice the weaknesses in something like Bukowski. Now, there's a difference because I still think Bukowski does something else, right? So, like, Bukowski doesn't have the, the, the technical craft on his side, but he does have that raw emotive side, that kind of emotion, that kind of, oof, it hits you in a certain place when you're reading it. Uh... And Lamone would have that too. I think that's an admirable way to write poems or fiction. You know, that's fine. Not the best way you could do it, but it's fine. Uh, the problem with Lamone's collection here is that she is uh, not giving me that emotional resonance. So she's giving me sloppy technique, but also giving me none of the emotional resonance that something like a Bukowski would give me. Uh, and that's really what I have an issue with. So without further ado, Let's just, let's go into it. I have a few pages of notes. Uh, I have, you know, hardcover first edition of this. I got it as soon as it came out. Uh, I actually got this, when did this come out? I want to say I got this for Christmas. Um, also, I think I totally have a, th I totally have a thing for Ada Lamone. Like, I think she's gorgeous. Uh, so that might affect my judgment a little bit, although I guess I'm just criticizing her, so it's not, like, huge, but yeah, I have a huge thing for Lamone. Lamone, Ada, come on the pod. Come on the podcast. Shout out. Anybody know her? Send her. Come on the pod. I'd love to talk to you. Um, so the hurting kind. First thing I noticed. Incredibly long. I said this in the monologue. It's too long. Way too long. Uh, just... 95 pages, 95 pages of poetry. And this isn't like a best of thing. All right. Like this is 95 page poetry collection. This is what I'm, this is what made me think of like the editing process. Like who was editing this with her? Who was going through the book giving, you know, how does it read? How does it work? Uh, blah, blah, blah. You know, all those things that are required of the editing process. And I just, I, I, I'm really struggling. Like, like I, it's so crazy to me that this is the case, that, 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 that nobody in the field of publishing is able to do this with a poet. And I just think, well, you know, if you're hiring, you know, uh, FSG, whatever, please hire me. Uh, I'm, I'm open to uh, being the poetry editor at your press. Uh, that goes for anybody, by the way. I'm more than happy to uh, do this. You could be that person at your press that works with poets to help them get the best collection they can do, right? So, like, if, if I was the editor and, 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 and somebody, like a poet, like Ada Lamone, hands me a manuscript that's 95 pages, my first instinct is, okay, what can be lost? What can be lost in this? 95 pages? 95 pages? It's indulgent, right? That's a sign of indulgence, in my opinion. And when you read through it, it is indulgent. It's rather indulgent. Um, yeah. I think there's also a sentimentality in this collection of poems that um, doesn't serve it well. I see this in, uh, man, I just, maybe it's just me and I'm seeing it everywhere recently, right? There is this overly sentimental attitude about everything, right? And it's tied up in nostalgia. It's tied up in this kind of internet um, um, fueled nostalgia that we're living through. Anybody notice this? Okay. That all the movies, all the characters, even the actors, like we have no new movie stars. We have no new like, musicians and, and, and bands. It, like, it just, we are living through one of the most stuck, unproductive and stagnant times, culturally, at least, uh, I, that I can ever remember. Uh, go ahead. Like I love following bands, doing new bands. Stuff. Like th there's so few, and the ones that do come out are relegated to the kind of you know DIY indie corners. There is no band that's going to break through. Uh, so for example, like and this is dumb, you know, but it's somewhat related to poetry with music. But I'm a huge Blink One Eighty Two fan. 
Love Blink-182. Love Tom DeLonge, really. I will stand Tom DeLonge. Uh, I don't care how crazy he gets. I'll stand him for his musical prowess, despite people shitting on him constantly his whole career. Uh, you listen to the new Blink-182 album. The one that dropped, whatever, a month ago or something now. It is so sentimental. Like, it is so overly sentimental that it loses the plot. Like, it's all about how great those times were 20 years ago. And I feel like this book is doing the same thing, right? Like, like this book is doing the exact same thing. We're, we're, we're just, we're, we're, we're talking about how great it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. Like, Lamoon is talking about being in high school and being, like, a straight-A student that smokes weed. And I'm just looking around going, like... I know, I get it, she's a little older than me, the generation before, but I'm just thinking, like, do you, like, I went to a nice school where the kids that got straight A's were all smoking, like, like not all of them, right, some of them were just straight up nerds, but, like, most, like, it just, it is so normal, it is so normal, and I'm just sitting here going, like, this is Instagram poetry, like, this has become the dominant form and i think it's enforced by places like poetry foundation like all these big mag i mean rattle especially rattle is garbage but i mean even poetry foundation has become the new rattle right like where we just have any garbage on the page and it's just there's this it's all instagram it's all this my feeling my feeling my feeling my feeling and also i'm a badass bitch right like this is what it is it's this kind of twerking on the timeline that that a lot of art has become not just poetry i think a lot of arts are, are suffering from this a lot of different art forms and crafts are suffering from the influence of social media and uh yeah i mean i don't know where i'm going with this it just they're just getting under my skin recently and I'm, I'm seeing it so you know if you're hearing this it's because you are listening to the free public feed of heavy board to get complete uncensored uninterrupted full access to this podcast become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board that's right heavy board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavyboard. nostalgia end it stop it let's build something new stop looking back let's look forward okay that's my fucking message to the world all artists of the world look toward the future stop looking toward the past and be nostalgic and or horrified okay like i'm tired of it i'm tired of obsession with a time that i wasn't alive for okay i'm approaching middle age and people are still talking about like 70 years ago. i'm like no 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 my, my, my parents are like that's their generation okay and they're about they're old they're retired they're approaching the last few years like the golden years okay like we do not. I'm tired of talking about it. I'm tired of thinking about it. I'm tired of having the newsreel shoved in my face, the kind of archival footage shoved in my face, the quotes, the shitty books that everybody overpraised. Like, I'm just, I'm tired of it. Look towards the future. Stop looking towards the past, either for horror or nostalgia. Okay, stop. Just look towards something new. Try to do something new. Try to do something that nobody has seen before. That is the entire purpose of artists and the culture. But of course, we're, we're, we're just because, so now artists are becoming these kind of nostalgia machines where they're all overly sentimental about a product that came out 30 years ago or about a song that came out 30 years. And I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. Move on. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. Let's read it. Let's let's get into some actual poetry so that I stop ranting about random like kind of cultural things that can't have anything done about them apart from me ranting. Let's get to something more substantive. The brass tacks of it. All right. So here's the first poem that really again this was the poem I read that just gave me you know I knew what I was I was like oh, okay this is what I'm getting into you know. This poem's called Give Me This, on page three. I thought it was the neighbor's cat, back, to clean the clock of the fledging robins low, in their nest stuck in the dense hedge by the house. But what came was much stranger, 
a liquidity, moving, all muscle and bristle, a groundhog, slippery and waddle thieving my tomatoes, still, green in the morning's shade, I watched her, munch and stand on her haunches, taking such pleasure in the watery bites. Why am I not allowed? Delight. A stranger writes to request my thoughts, on suffering, barbed wire pulled out of the mouth, as if demanding that I kneel to the trap of coiled spikes used in warfare and fencing. Instead, I watch the groundhog more closely, and a sound escapes. Me, a small spasm of joy I did not imagine. When I woke, she is a funny creature and earnest, and she is doing what she can to survive. So you heard me read this, and you heard me, I specifically read out the line breaks here. Some of them aren't so bad. Some of them are just completely god-awful. I watch the groundhog more closely, and the sound break me, comma, a small... Like, like, this is what I mean. This is supposedly a seasoned poet. A seasoned poet. And it just seems random, haphazard, haphazard. And then, of course, this is, she's looking out a window, right? She's looking out a window. The best line in this entire fucking poem is barbed wire pulled out of the mouth when requesting about, you know, thoughts on suffering. That was the best part of this entire poem. But the problem is, is that it's one fucking line in this whole poem. So it's not very good. Again, and then we get this kind of, you know, the, uh, the, the, the gopher or whatever the fuck it is, the groundhog, right? And then we have this, give me this. What is it giving her? Give me this doing what you can to survive i just i just i don't it isn't enough like this isn't confessional this is observational but it's trying to be confessional right like there are confessional elements and this is what i was just getting so frustrated with throughout this whole book it wants to be a confessional book it wants to be confessional poetry but it's too afraid to be that's i'll leave it at that i'll leave it at that and i don't want to read drowning creek it's too long let's read swear on it well the one i mentioned on page five Loosen the thin threads, spooling in the rafters, invisible nests in nights, green offerings, divide, and then divide again, American linden looming over the street lights, so much taller is the tree, so much taller is the tree. Maybe you all can tell me what that's about. Is this just not random, raw, fucking subconscious like a random reference to things like i like frank o'hare i really do and he has that you know kind of the oh i do this i do that type poem this isn't even that this isn't even giving us that much detail right about like the toilet bowl still flushing as you walk into an empty apartment right like it's not even giving us that kind of detail it's talking about a groundhog eating tomatoes in a backyard garden and at the end of it is oh she's just trying to survive She's trying to survive. Again, there are these desperate attempts, usually at the end, in the last kind of couple lines or the last stanza of a lot of the poems in this collection, that just try to just insert some type of meaning because it's going nowhere. Then there's just like this desperate attempt to insert meaning and broaden out the images into something that like, you know, matters and isn't just a mild observation of a, of a fucking groundhog eating tomatoes out of a garden. Like, I don't know. It's just not enough for me. It's not enough. You know, I don't even want to read these. I was going to read For Scythia and To the Fox. I just don't even want to go back and reread it. But this is where, in the For Scythia on page 10 and End To the Fox on page 11, this is where I noticed that, you know, the kind of Mary Oliver comparison where, you know, if you're going to write about nature now, so, you know, Keats, you know, Wordsworth, you know, Thoreau, these types of, you know, the, the masters that wrote nature poetry and things like that. And one, they, they really romanticized the shit out of it. So that was a benefit to them writing nature books. Two, it was new when they would walk around, like, you know, their little yard or their little field in the forest and write about the wildflowers. It was kind of still new. It was kind of still uh, fresh. Nobody had really been doing that, like this kind of over-romanticizing the nature nature in the natural world and just kind of observing things as you sit in a, feed, in a field. Uh, but then, you know, in the 20th century, Mary Oliver, and now the 21st century, Ada Lamone here, it's, if you're going to do that, just know, 
it's been done before, right? And you have to do something to make it a little bit fresh. You have to tie it in to something that's a little bit beyond what the romantics did. <clears throat> and this is where I just don't like it. I don't like it. This is why I reject a lot of nature poems because they aren't doing much anymore. So the stuff from, you know, the 1800s, I can get behind a lot of it, sure. But the stuff that's coming out in the 1900s and then, the, you know, now in the 2000s, it's just, it's not enough. It's not enough. It, it, you have to do something. You have to tie it into something. Whatever. Okay, I'm going to talk about the, the worst line break in the entire collection. And that is on page 20. The poem is called Not the Saddest Thing in the World. Uh, why don't I just read? It's a... Oh God, these couplets. These fucking couplets. Again, you can see the weakness in Lamone's work in a poem like this on page 20 because the couplets are there for no reason. The couplets don't tie the lines together. They don't make little rhymes, so they're not there for that. They're there to give a poem that otherwise would have zero structure, some desperate attempt at structure, okay? So here, I'll read it. All day I feel some itchiness around the collar, constricting of, constriction of living. I write the date at the top of a letter, though no one has been writing the year lately. I write the year, seems like a year you should write, huge and round and awful. In between my tasks, I find a dead fledgling, maybe dove, maybe dunno to be honest, too embryonic, too see-through and wee. I don't even mourn him, just all matter of fact like take the trowel, plant the limp body with a new host under the main feeder seems like a good place for a closed eye thing forever closed eye forever close eye under a green plant in the ground under the feast up above between the ground and the feast is where i live now before i bury him i snap a photo and beg my brother and my husband to witness this nearly clear body once it has been witnessed and buried i go about my day which isn't ordinary exactly because nothing is ordinary now even when it is ordinary now something's breaking always on the on the skyline falling over and over against the ground sometimes unnoticed sometimes covered up like sorrow sometimes buried without even a song <sighs> i'm furious at this poem it's so bad but okay uh, one, two, three, four, five. The fifth stanza on the last couplet, this, the second line of the couplet on the fifth stanza here. Too embryonic to see through and we. I don't even mourn him, just all matter of fact. And matter of fact like is, is hyphenated to make it all one word. Matter of fact like. But it's broken. Okay, it's broken. That little thing that's meant to connect it to make it all one thing is broken in half. And... This was the worst line break I've seen in the entire collection. Like, not only does it ignore the kind of, you know, um, not just the structure of the poem, but the structure of the, of the actual phrasing and the use of a hyphenation with a couple different words hyphenated together. But it just makes no sense. Like, it makes no sense. Like, can any of you come up with a reason for why this is broken where it is? Can any of you out there do it? I don't even think Ada could give us a fucking reason as to why she broke up this phrase like this, okay? Because she doesn't know. She doesn't know why she did it. And maybe she'd be, oh, I liked it. Okay, great. You liked it. It's still bad. Like, it's not good. So, all right. And this is where I was like, okay, at this point I was getting to the end of the first section and I just realized as I got to the end of the first section, you know, 20 some pages in, and that was the spring section. I'm in the summer section and I was just like, okay, I could stop reading right now, <laughs> and I don't think I would miss anything. It Begins with the Trees is another one where I was just like really trying to, where I just thought, this, okay, this is another good one to be pulled as an example for what's not working. All right, let's read this one. It Begins with the Trees. Two full cypress trees in the clearing intertwine in a way that almost makes them seem like one. And two, at a certain angle, from the blue blow-up pool I bought this summer to save my life, I see it is not one tree but two and they are kissing. They are kissing so tenderly, it feels rude to watch, one hand on the other's shoulder, another in the other's branches, like hair. And when did kissing become so dangerous? Or was it always so? That illicit kiss in the bathroom of the four-faced liar, a bar, named after a clock. What was her name? Or the first one with you? On the corner of Metropolitan Avenue? No, sorry, this is a bad line break. On the corner of Metropolitan Break Avenue, comma, before you came home with me forever. 
I watch those green trees now and it feels libidinous. If you're hearing this, it's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored, full-length episodes, jerk shop, heavy bonus content, subscribers-only AMA episodes, bonus extended interviews, and more. Come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board. I want them to go on kissing without fear. I want to watch them and not feel so ashamed by hands. Come home. Everything is begging you. I, I just, I don't even want to do this. I'm just shocked at how kind of random the things, it just keeps getting random and random. All right, so we have the trees. The trees are kissing. This comparison. Blah, blah, blah. I don't like it. All right, I'm not going to say anything more. I don't care about it. Moving on. Uh, let's go down to... Let's go to open water on page 50 here. And I think that might be the last one I cover because I just don't give a shit about this book. Uh, man. Man. All right, let's read Open Water. It does no good to trick and weave and lose the other ghosts, to shove the buried deeper into the sandy loam, the riverine silt. Still you come, my faithful one, the sound of a body so persistent. In water I cannot tell if it is a wave or you moving through. A month before you died, you wrote a letter to old friends saying you swam <clears throat> with a pot of dolphins in open water saying goodbye. But what you told me most about was the eye, that enormous reckoning eye of an unknown fish that passed you during that last-ditch defiant swim. On the shore, you described the fish as nothing you'd seen before, a blue-gray behemoth moving slowly and enduringly through its deep, fathomless North Pacific waters. That night, <clears throat> I heard more about that fish and that eye than anything else. I don't know why it has come to me this morning, warm rain and landlocked. I don't deserve the image, but I keep thinking how something saw you. Something was bearing witness to you out there in the ocean, where you were no one's mother and no one's wife. But you, in your original skin, right before you died, you were beheld. And today in my kitchen with you, now ten years gone, I am so happy for you. <sighs> All right, so let me break this down for you. This is what I mean by a restrictive confessional poem, right? Who is the you in this case? Who is the you? A month before you died. You. Who is that? Uh, I know people would say, what, is her father or something? Um, okay, we don't know that from the poem. You know that from following her on Twitter or whatever. Uh, but more so, it's an example of the poet not being honest, this kind of restrictive confessional aspect. So they're, they're like, this is a poem that wants to be confessional. It wants to give us this kind of, this this little story about the, the, the person dying and, and then the, the speaker feeling happy for them in a kitchen 10 years later. Um, but it's withholding. It's withholding so much. We don't know what's going on. And it gets lost because of this reservation, this kind of holding back. And it makes it so that there's less resonance for the reader. So the reason confessional poems work is because, one, they're vulnerable. Two, they're saying something that you wouldn't otherwise normally get. You know, this is a personal kind of almost, you're being very personal, but you're also giving that to the world. So that's a vulnerability. There's that. <clears throat> and it appears that Lamone doesn't want to take that step. And look, she's not to be blamed for that. That's a difficult step to take. I'm not that interested in taking a step like that. Uh, many writers are. Of course, I think many writers are interested in that stuff like that because it's a weakness as opposed to um, <clears throat> their skill. But still, I think 
the, the restrictiveness, the, re, the reservations that I can feel through the page here about a poem like this, where there's just not enough given as to what's going on here, and about the speaker being happy, we don't know why it matters that the speaker's happy for people. Like, we don't know. Um, again, it's just, it's again, it's Instagram. It's Instagram poetry, okay? That's what it is. Uh, and it's clearly heavily influenced by that. I've seen this in other writers too. If you, if anybody follow Chen Chen out there, yeah. I enjoyed his first book. It was very highly praised. Um, maybe a little overpraised, but it was still quite good. Uh, his latest stuff, oh my God, that guy fell off a cliff. Like, and the reason he fell off a cliff is because he, all he does is scroll. All he does is scroll. Um, yeah. Just just compare the first couple poems to the stuff he's writing now. Same with Ada. If you compare her earlier stuff pre-internet to what she's writing now, just it's not there. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I hope that makes sense to everybody about why this, this feels like it's reserved confessional that therefore fails, right? And the kind of sections giving form and all that and blah, blah, blah. All right, I don't want to talk about this book anymore. I'm done talking about it. Um... <clears throat> That's it. That's all I had. I, I said it all. I don't, you know. Uh, for next year's podcast episodes, I do have a few things planned here. I'm going to try to do less solo episodes, but then I'm also going to try and do still keep some of the solo episodes going. But you know, you let me go. What do you guys think? Or if there's a writer or anybody you want me to interview again, send me an email, heavyboardpodcast at gmail dot com. I'm always happy to uh, take recommendations from listeners members of the community, etc., etc. Uh, okay, before we go, support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash heavyboard. $5 a month, it's worth it, helps out this podcast, helps it grow, helps the podcast remain in place so that I can keep doing this and all that. Please support us if you can. If you can't do that, don't want to, <clears throat> there are other ways to support this podcast. You can subscribe, like, share any of our YouTube videos at Heavy Board and at Heavy Board Clips on YouTube. Those are our two YouTube channels. Give them a subscribe, give them a like, give them a share. Helps us out. Uh, you can also leave us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. This is, again, a free way to support us. Helps us out. Helps the podcast go grow. Just click that five-star. Helps us out. Totally free. Uh, and then of course, I'm still looking for workshop stories. I'm still looking for, even I'm expanding it now. So if you've been listening along, I've been expanding that to not just workshop stories, cultural stories about the kind of academy, uh, MFA experiences and, and all that. Uh, so write that in heavy at gmail.com. And if you just want to say, Hey, what's up? I like the podcast, heavy at gmail.com. That's it. That's it. Uh, all right. This has been another episode of Heavy Board. See you. Heavy Board. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy board. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.